Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Corey and this is Practicing with Corey where I bring you into my world and show you what I'm working on and the techniques I use to practice. In this particular video I'm working on Chopin's third ballade in A flat major, Opus 47. I will play bits and pieces of it. I'm not going to by no means perform the whole thing for you or practice the whole thing for you, but if you'd like to learn more of this ballad and many, many other works as well, tutorials, you can go to the Well-Rounded Pianist at wellroundedpianist.com and uh, sign up. It's very, very affordable. That's my main teaching website. I've been teaching over 35 years and I want to be your personal professor. I have this particular ballad uploaded there with a series of super slow videos where you can see the overhead camera view and uh, I play it at half speed. It's very very easy to follow if you would like to learn this and other works as well. So I highly highly encourage you to visit and sign up with the well-rounded pianist. It happens to be like 8 in the morning here on uh, sunny I guess reasonably nice uh, Florida winter weather outside. I should actually be outside exercising or something, but I'm in here. Uh, I, I happen to not get a whole lot of practice time these days because I'm working on a lot of things, preparing books and doing a lot of teaching and so forth, but I happen to have a little time on my hands today and I have been working on this third ballad mainly because I assigned it to a very talented student I have on Skype and uh, he, he's never played any of the ballads before and uh, I was, you know, just, I like to play things or practice things that I assign my students. So uh, I've been playing this and, you know, like I said, it, it's also uploaded to the Well-Rounded Pianist where you can view uh, my tutorials on this ballad. It, I'm playing out of this book, which I'm sure many of you probably have or have seen. It's the uh, complete ballads in the a reprint of the Paderewski edition. I think it's a good edition. So, anyway, um, this is a really beautiful piece. I really, really love it. I, and it's of course all the ballads are great and you know it's hard to say what which is my favorite or anything but I'm going to just uh, play a little for you and explain how I go about practicing and what I think you should do in your practice so let's just start here I'll also by, by the way I, I, I sit in an office chair office chairs are perfectly acceptable you don't have to always be on a piano bench uh, I'm here. I'm here all the time in 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 my room, either teaching or doing something or working at my desk or doing a little practicing. Office chairs are great because you have a back and you can relax and you you don't have to worry about you know get being with perfect posture and all of that. So you know, if I were to perform this in a concert, I you know I wouldn't use a a, a, a chair like this, but it does the job when I'm practicing.
that. So calm and so nice. Of course, this is slower. Okay, always practice slow. You know, I was uh, I saw a video not too long ago by um, the great violinist <laughs> whose name actually slips my mind, um, and he, and well, I'll probably think of his name. Anyway, he he was saying always practice slower than what you need to do. Oh, it um, it's on Perlman. <laughs> It's not Perlman. Perlman really, the great violinist, advocates slow practice, and so do I. Slow practice. Slow practice. I can't emphasize that too much. Just too many students try to rush through things and they can't hear themselves. You need to be able to hear everything you're doing. say slow okay I'm not there's there's a there's a difference between absolutely too slow and something that has a little bit of motion so Chopin marks this allegretto an allegretto moderately fast we would say now after there there's the note learning stage so you're learning notes when you learn the notes You have to go really slow. Some some have to go slower than others, just to so you can learn the notes. Okay, once you know the notes, you need to start thinking in phrases. But don't don't think up to speed yet. So That's in a strict beat. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, did you hear that when you're doing it at that speed, I would say this is about probably 60% or perhaps 70% of the full speed. It's not a terribly, terribly fast piece anyway, but it's slower. So you don't want when I say slow, I don't mean... Although you could do that. I mean, that, that, you know, there's no limits with how slow you can play. But it has to have some kind of, some kind of phrasing. Some, you know, you can't, it can't die totally. So one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, the rhythm of this ballad and the other ballads is very much like the Siciliano rhythm of Bach. Dun, ta, dun, dun, ta, dun. One and two, ta, dun. Um, ba, ba. play it at that speed you can hear all the pedaling. You can hear when the pedal is clear and when it's not clear. So you need to be very careful about the pedaling. Now I want to go and, and just offer you some suggestions here in 8, 9, 10. In measure 10, or my, 9 and 10 you have, you have that, then you have those, those, don't play that with one hand, just break it between the hands. That way you can get a better slur. A lot of pianists try to do this. And then it it's really hard to make it sound graceful if you do it with one hand. You can just do that. Break it between the hands. B 
because Chopin wrote all of these in the right hand. have to do with one hand. I mean, it's certainly possible. And he also says legato here. So he has a legato line. I mean, you could work and work and work at it, struggle to try to get legato with four and five and so forth up on the top. Or you could just do the easy way, which is... Take the bottom notes with your left hand. That's all you do. You know, so many pianists. I've I've seen a lot of pianists play this. So many pianists try to try to struggle and try to do it with their right hand, where with the left hand, also that doesn't need to be in time. So when you play with a metronome, you can stretch those eight notes out. I'm going to play with a metronome in a, in a couple minutes, and I'll show you that. so on. Now that is the first two pages. I like to also do this. There is a second section in which it has, um, it goes or it goes into this nice kind of uh, swaying kind of rhythm. But what I like to do or I've been doing this for the past couple days as I practice this, these two pages here. These are the ones that have uh, the main theme. Then I like to skip over to measure 116 in about the same speed. So I'm going to take the speed. exactly the same speed as I was doing before. And Chopin doesn't mark it faster. So eventually when you do the ballade up to speed, there is no reason at all to go faster here than you do in the beginning. So that's why I like to do this, because it keeps you grounded in the same tempo. But remember, we're at about 60% or 70% tempo here. So. Four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. suggest here is Chopin has these small notes notes however you want to play it. I like to break it between the hands. I like to take the first two notes instead of instead of having to do the whole thing with the right hand, I like to do take the first three notes with the left hand. But uh, regardless of how you do that stretch the beat out. So this is not going to be exactly in time. It's not going to be exactly in time. So when you have these, when you have like da 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 da, the beat really starts on the top note. Not counting, you don't have to do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. Okay, a lot a lot of people think they have to get all of those notes in. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's like eight eight fast notes. A lot of students think they have to get all those eight notes in in like half a beat or something, so you can stay on time. You don't have to do that. Remember that you can use rubato and Chopin. This is what I consider to be the proper 
use of rubato, you're stretching out certain things, these expressive notes. But then, once you get here, you're in time. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now it's suspended. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you can hear, I suggest a little retard, another da da dum here, then you're in time here. Here it's suspended again. like into the second theme with that sort of lilting rhythm. Da -dum, da -dum. I love this section. This is among my favorite, absolute favorite passages in all of Chopin's works. I don't know why. It's just, you know, this isn't a showy, it's not a showy ballad. It's not one that's, um, you know, it's not, I don't think it's technically as difficult as, like, say, the, the other three ballads. That's why when I recommend a ballad for a student, I always pick this one first. Because it's beautiful. It doesn't have a whole lot of tempo changes throughout the thing, so you can keep it pretty consistent throughout. And I just love this. I love this, this sound of this. It's so beautiful. Once again, I'm in measure 116. Very light and airy. Now it's a little more forceful. Now let me say something about these trills. A lot of students worry, <laughs> they 
worry so much about trills. They think, oh, you have to measure every single note in the trill. No, this isn't Bach. You don't have to really measure the trills. Just wiggle your finger. And if it's under speed, remember we're about 60 to 70% under speed here. So. Just wiggle it a little bit, da, 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 da. not too fast. Remember, we're under speed. So you don't want to do trills when you're under speed. You don't want to do... It, it, that's ridiculous. Don't do trills like that. Trills are not always as fast as possible. Your trills are only as fast as your tempo is. So they're proportionally as slow as your tempo. So if you're going at a slower tempo, the trills are slower as well. So don't worry so much about that. Just wiggle your finger and you'll be okay. You know what's interesting too is a lot of uh, pianists overlook this. There's D, little D crescendos on. Little D crescendos here. And also he says sostenuto, which implies a slightly, perhaps a slightly slower speed. So here's a place where if you're thinking about changing the tempo a little, having a little rubato, this is the place to do it. So you might want to you know, maybe go a little slower here, or you can give the impression of going slower by doing these little decrescendos here. crescendo there. I love this. It's so beautiful. It's not showy. It's not showy. It's not something that you can show off with, but it really is very beautiful. Now I'm going to go over to the next page here. I'm going to skip this second theme material. I'm going to go, what Chopin does here is he changes key. He goes into the, uh, he goes into the key of C sharp minor. This is in measure 157. So I'm going to take the original tempo. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's what we've been doing. And I'm going to do this at that tempo, no faster. One, two, three, four, five, six. here to the melody. Chopin has, has accents here. So he has So bring, bring the top voice out. Keep this very soft here. Get little, little staccatos here. here. Bring, 
bring out the tenor line. That's mostly with the thumb of the left hand. That's what you need to hear. like the sort of the climax of the whole piece is right here before the coda section now did you hear the tempo did you hear the tempo I'm at one two three four five six I know faster than I was at the beginning Five, six, all the way to B major. This is a great passage. This is what is called the circle of fifths passage. Circle of fifths passage. So what, what he's doing here harmonically is he's, you're in C sharp minor here. I'm in measure 178 here. So you're in C sharp minor. C sharp minor. Now, Look at the bass notes. He goes F sharp to B, F sharp to B, that's in the circle of fifths. F sharp leads to B. F sharp is the dominant of B. So you have C sharp, and you have you have F sharp seven to B. Then B is the if you go if you go five down from B or four up from B, you get to E. So that's the dominant of the next chord, which is E7. And then that leads to A, as E is the dominant of A. Then, then, and then you have a D sharp, that's the dominant of G sharp. Then you have a C sharp. That's the dominant of S sharp. And then you have a B. That's the dominant of E. You have A sharp. It's the dominant of D sharp. G sharp is the dominant of C sharp. Sorry. Then you have F sharp. Sorry. F sharp is the dominant of B. So you have just this whole string of, of um, circle of fifths progression. This is what we would call secondary dominance. Secondary dominance. We have a dominant of a dominant going to a dominant. A dominant of a dominant. So it just goes on. It can go forever. So you know what's going on harmonically. Circle of fifths progression. long 
Circle of Fifth Progressions. One of the longest in all of Chopin's works of Circle of Fifth Progressions is here. Now it goes on into this very mysterious kind of place. student that I assigned this to said it was weird, or I don't know, not this section in particular, but he, he's used to showier things and he was saying this sounds weird. Sorry about that. Now, he, he's kind of modulated now to F minor, he, has, he wasn't forced sharps which is the key signature of E major or C sharp minor. Now he's going to four flats because he's working his way back to A flat major. So he knew what he was doing harmonically. He's sort of working his way back to A flat major. So sound wrong, but they're actually correct. Now he's modulated to like G minor now. Ah, a little, uh, just goes up a half step here. He's in E flat. That's the dominant of A flat. So he's preparing for the big for the big change to going back to A flat major. You know, we haven't had A flat major in this piece since like three pages ago. So you, you really had he hasn't been in his main key. So he's working back to that. I'm in measure 205. You have a pedal point E flat. Ah, it finally arrives. Finally arrives at A flat here. Took all that time. Also, another thing, I'm going to get back to tempo. Listen as I play. Two, three, four, five, six. not faster here. Although when it's up to speed, when it's not 60 to 70 percent slower, when it's up to speed, it, it's perfectly permissible to you know go a little faster here. But I recommend when you're practicing it, when you're just in that learning stage, getting everything solid, to keep it the same as 
the beginning. And, and the adrenaline and everything that, that you have when you do a complete performance, of course, it's going to be faster. But you need to hold yourself back in the learning stage of not going too fast. major. Of course he says stretto here, so in a, in a complete, in a real performance, when you're up to speed, you'll be speeding up a little bit here. But when you're practicing, you don't need to do that. saying this is I'm gonna say this again and again and again just so you know this is under speed of course I can play it faster just wiggle your finger now this last arpeggio you could do one hand if you want or you can make it easier on yourself and do uh, Let's get that. It's actually easier. You can actually get a much better sound, a much cleaner sound if you just break, and I like to do that. I know it's cheating, but I like to cheat. So anyway, this is a little taste of the ballad. I'm sorry I didn't go over the, the whole thing. I didn't go over the second theme part because I wanted to focus on the, the uh, technically harder parts, I guess, of doing that. Now, I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit <clears throat> with a metronome. I'm putting it on 42, 42 beats per minute, and this will be my practice speed here. Thank you. 
he learned, he learned that from Bach. It sounds like Bach. Very Bachian kind of voice leading there. Now I'm going to just jump over and keep the same speed. spider fingers to play a lot of passages, especially in the left hand. Now I'm going to jump over here to measure 157, same speed.
you know, it sounds very academic with the metronome. I know that. But it, it's, it's a good way of learning. I would suggest that you get down the base level. You don't, don't mess around in the early stages. In the early stages, you want to get it as solid as you can. Uh, this is the only, really the only ballad that stays all, that could theoretically stay in one speed. This is the only of the four ballads that can do that. So um, it's sort of Bachian in that way, actually. And it's very, uh, the tempo is, is just kind of one tempo all the way through. One rhythm, one tempo. Uh, with some rubatos here and there, but generally speaking, it stays pretty consistent. You want to focus on the sound. Focus on your sound, on the beauty of the sound you're producing. And uh, I thank you very much for vid viewing this video of me practicing and expressing my views to you on, on how to practice. Go over to the Well-Rounded Pianist, join and learn more of this work and many, many other works as well. Until we meet again.